We are going to move to Göttingen uh, by the beginning of next year, and this is our new building. It's uh, nearly ready, and we are looking forward to moving to the new site, uh, which is much closer to the university environment. So um, just to give you an idea about the institute itself, so it's located near, near Göttingen, so it's between Hanover and Frankfurt, essentially, in the center of Germany. And you see the two locations are only 25 kilometers apart from each other, so the little village, kattelnburg lindau which used to be very close to the German border between the west and the east. And we will move to Göttingen, which is the one of the, uh, the oldest universities in Germany. Um, we'll not spend much time on it, but it's highly relevant to show you what we are, going, we are doing in, uh, in Lindau and later on, hopefully, also in, uh, in Göttingen. So we have been involved in more than 100 participations in space missions. And you can see all the lists uh, of uh, space missions listed here on the right. So we have about 300 people working there, a lot of guests, a lot of postdocs, and PhD students. And this magnetosphere department has moved into the planetary department, and we have now a third department dealing with the interior of the sun and stars. So most important for you, we have one of the mo most complete solar system schools in the world, if not you know, in the galaxy. Um, and we offer continuously PhD positions to do solar system research. So if you are interested after your degree and if you are wanted to come to Germany to do this kind of research, please check this website and you will find all the details. OK, so let's start with, uh, with the lecture. I have structured it in a, uh, in a way that I'm going to do a, a little bit of introduction of what, of what, what I'm going to uh, show you today. Um, and then we'll go through the different sources of energetic particles in the heliosphere, where I'm going to, as I said, concentrate mostly on number E, which is my, uh, my background. And you have heard about some of the other sources of heliospheric particles already during the week. So um, in the introduction, I would like to emphasize again the importance of energetic particles, because they are a very, very useful tool to study nearly everything in the heliosphere, from fundamental physics all the way to magnetospheric configuration and dynamics, because they are relatively easy instruments which you, uh, which you build to do this kind of science. Um, and you, you can do uh, a lot of physics and uh, a lot of different variety of topics to tackle with this kind of instrumentation. Um, and I'm going to show you a lot of examples during uh, the lecture. So you heard about this, I'm sure, in the beginning of the week already. So the sources of those particles are all over the place uh, in the heliosphere from the sun to the corrotating interaction regions, coronal mass ejections, shocks in the interplanetary space, and of course the planetary magnetospheres, where Fran gave a very nice lecture, I guess. And then, of course, there are also input from the interstellar space with the interstellar neutral gas and the galactic cosmic rays. So the particle types we deal with are electrons, charged atoms, molecules, and neutrals, and of course dust, what you heard yesterday already. Um, the energy range is everything between EV and 10 to the 20 EV. And so this is really um, you know, a, a large variety of uh, uh, energies where you have to build different instrumentation to be able to measure those. I think I can skip this. So most important, of course, are the motion uh, of the charged particles in magnetic fields. And you heard about this, so I will skip it. Um, um, I didn't know what the others are going to present, so I put in a few slides uh, before. Um, so most important, what I will show you later in some of the, the measurements um, are a couple of parameters which we in the energetic particles uh, community deal with, which is the phase space density, which is essentially the number of particles in the phase space. And you heard about this as well, particle flux, and of course the correlation between the phase space density and the flux, uh, which is constant. And uh, I'm going to show you later on a little bit of uh, what can be done with energetic particles in the magnetospheres. Uh, and therefore, the diffusion equation, at least for the radial diffusion, uh, is also something of a parameter which we would like to uh, introduce in the beginning before I'm going to show you some of the results. The particle spectra, I'm sure you saw this as well. So I maybe just add a few things about um, the, uh, the different uh, energy um, 
spectra types we are going to see in the, in the, in the other slides. So there is the solar wind, the bulk velocity, which is a Maxwellian type of distribution. Then you have a, a kappa or a power law distribution following at higher energies. And then you see these uh, power law distributions for the higher energies going up to 1,000 uh, MeV per nucleon. If you then continue, you see this hump here in the, uh, in the galactic cosmic ray, which has a, a maximum between somewhere between 10 and 100 MeV per nucleon. Um, if you go to higher energies, then you see these uh, additional power law distributions all the way down to several tera electron volts in space. But of course, the number of particles are going down by 20 orders of magnitude. So um, in order to get an idea and what uh, you, know, you can derive from energy particle measurements, the kappa distribution function is something you have to deal with, which is a Maxwellian if your kappa goes to infinity. And um, you see three different types of uh, kappa distributions here with the different coefficients. So this is essentially what um, we try to explain the energy spectra we measure with our particle detectors uh, with. Uh, a little easier, and this is what we normally use in the energetic particle range above, a couple of hundred keV is that we use power law, where we only have to deal with the, the, um, the gamma coefficient. Um, and the, this slope is called the spectral energy spectral index, which can be um, very helpful if you want to determine if there are some acceleration mechanisms uh, going on in the heliosphere or in planetary magnetospheres. And um, so it's simply, it's the slope of the energy spectrum at higher energies. And if the gamma is small, then you call it a hard spectrum. And if it's large, then you call it a soft spectrum. So when this is rocking back and forth, you can tell that something is going on in the magnetosphere, for example. Um, before I go into some of the other sources, I would like to introduce a few basic um, detector types and uh, instruments which we use to get our measurements. And I will start with the, uh, the detector types itself. I don't know if you're familiar with this, if I can do this very briefly, or if this is of great interest, so just let me know. Um, so basically what we use in energetic particle measurements are channeltrons or microchannel plates as the, the main detector, and of course then solid state detectors. Um, they are sensitive enough to detect electrons and all the other species we are interested in, uh, in the uh, few EV range, but of course there are some shortcuts which you have to deal with when you build an instrument, which I'm going to show you later. So the basic three processes we use to um, measure those energetic particles in space are listed here. So you uh, use the energy loss in matter, which is the DEDX principle, or you use the time of flight principle, where you have a start and a stop uh, impulse, and you know the, the lengths of between the start and the stop signal. So you can find out um, energy and energy per charge. And uh, the, the third process we are going to use, or we normally use, are if you look at the waveform of the various signals at the detector and you use a pulse shape analysis, then you can find out a little more and in more detail in terms of energy of what you have really measured and what you have in your detectors. So the principle of the EDX is listed here. Um, so if a particle uh, hits matter, it creates secondary um, uh, particles at the surface and inside the um, the, the matter itself, and it's losing energy, so you can uh, try to find out what the original energy was, because it's directly linearly dependent on the, um, the incident energy, what the particle can lose in a, in a matter. Um, so what you currently do in the DEDX uh, versus E principle is that you have a stack of three or more detectors in a row, and you measure the energy loss in the first detector, and the energy loss in the second detector, and eventually the loss in the, in the third detector. And by a combination of those, in terms of coincidences, you can find out if you measured an electron or an ion, or if it was too uh, fast and had too high energy that uh, it did not stop in the third detector. So you use um, these kind of measurements to find out what energy and what species you have detected uh, in your detector. 
And if you go into the detail about what is this all about in, in mathematical analysis, this energy loss in matter is proportional to the, um, the square of the, uh, the, 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 the nuclear charge, uh, and it's also, um, in, which is in this, in this beta, uh, it's also um, proportional to the energy they had uh, before they entered the matter. So I will not go into all the details, but this is the, the current principle we use, and this is what comes out of such a detector if you simply plot the energy loss in the first detector versus the, the energy in the second detector, then the masses split and show different uh, curves in, in, in this matrix. And you can, by simply looking along the, the, um, the various um, curves for the various species, you can determine actually a composition of energetic particles in space. And this is... Uh, was used in a couple of missions already for, um, yeah, for nearly all the missions in for the Earth, Jupiter, and Saturn. The other principle is, of course, an electrostatic analyzer, um, where you have um, an analyzer mainly built out of two different uh, spherical shells, um, where you put some voltages on, and the the, uh, the dimension uh, determines your energy resolution and the number of particles you can measure. Uh, you have an analyzer, a detector, and then the electronics, which gives you the idea to um, what you have uh, measured before. And the principle is simple, that you have a voltage in such a way that only one particle with an energy per charge can make it through the detector, through the analyzer. The other ones are too fast or too slow, and they hit the walls and are lost. So by tuning the voltages, between the two spherical shells, you can really scan through the entire energy spectrum, and you measure um, the energy per charge of the incoming uh, ions or electrons. Just to give you an idea how a real experiment looks like, this is, as an example of an electrostatic analyzer, this is the, um, the EMA instrument on the ASPRA instrument flying on Mars Express. So you have this deflector voltage here, then you have this is the the, um, the analyzer part where you see one of the trajectories of an incoming ion is bent in this, uh, in this field between the electrostatic spheres and is then measured um, in, in MCPs in that case. So this gives you an idea of what um, an electrostatic analyzer works, how it works. Um, the other principle we use is the time of flight technique where you combine the electrostatic analyzer principle with the time of flight measurement. And usually what is used here, you have a thin carbon foil. After you have measured the E over Q of an incoming ion, this is hitting the carbon foil, releasing secondary electrons, giving you a start pulse. It's running through this time of flight lengths in between your detector. It's hitting a solid state detector, essentially giving you a stop signal from secondary ions. And you measure the, the energy in, in, the, um, in a solid state detector at the end of your um, of your instrument. So you not only have E over Q, you have M over Q, and from those two you can determine the mass of the species. And uh, this is a very uh, useful technique which is used everywhere in space. Another example how this can look like in a flying or nearly flying instrument, this is the MSA sensor on the uh, Bepi Colombo mission which hopefully will launch to Mercury in 2016. So you see this is the analyzer part. Um, you have here uh, in this area you have the carbon foil giving you start and stop signals uh, and in addition you have a linear electric field with a time of flight analysis uh, included in there so you have different MCPs for incoming neutrals or ions or um, for the electrons on the other side. So this gives you an idea of what is being done uh, with carbon foils. Carbon foils, of course, has also a, a small delta E loss in the carbon foil itself, so you cannot go to very low energies. And therefore, there is a new principle, which hopefully will also fly on Bepi Colombo, where <clears throat> you have no carbon foil, and you can go down to very low energies, uh, which are really you know, EV and not a couple of EV. And this principle is um, essentially 
the same, but without a carbon foil. And in order to get an idea of how many particles were coming through, and in order to get a start and stop signal, um, you have a high frequency gate, which you open up and close at, ME, at, at megahertz uh, frequencies. And by doing so, you have an idea of when it's open, you have a start. When you close, you have a sort of a stop. And therefore, you have, without a carbon foil, much lower energy measurements possible. So this is a new concept which will fly on Pepe Colombo. So if you have done your, your instrument, these are the things you have to worry about when you want to put it on a spacecraft. So if you go through that, it's very important that you know uh, what, are, uh, what is your instrument doing in space, where is it located, is it a spinning or non-spinning instrument, therefore you have to select the different analyzers. Um, how much is the, the telemetry rate? So you can put anything on a spacecraft, but you have to also get down the data. And all these things are very important in order to, to do real measurements in space. Uh, and these are normally the limiting factors. So when you want to do neutrals then at the end, you can't, you can't use the same principle. So you have to, if you want to measure neutrals, you have to um, really um, reduce also the, the, you know, the charged particles first in order to be able to measure the, the neutrals. So you have to show that in your instrument there are no ions and electrons which can enter. And you usually do this by um, a deflection system. So you remove the ions first and what is left in your inside of your detector which measures, which can be measured at the detector itself is then neutrals. Um, with a lot of shortcuts, but I not, will, will not go into the details. But I want to show you how this really uh, can work. And this is this ANA principle. I need to show this before you can understand what the measurements uh, look like, which will, will be shown later. So um, if you want to measure a high energy neutral particle, you have to understand how they are created. So it's essentially a charge exchange collision between a low energy neutral and a high energy uh, charged particle. Um, they simply exchange their charges. You have a high energy neutral and a low energy ion. So um, if you want to measure those in the KV or MEV range, then you have to find a way to, to do this. And this has been perfectly been done um, at APL, at the Johns Hopkins University, with the neutral camera called INCA, which is flying on Cassini very successfully. But it is also, if you look at the, the lower energy neutrals, has been performed by um, an instrument called GAS, which flew on Ulysses and did the, the first measurements of the interstellar incoming neutral particles from, from interstellar space. If you want to go down in energy even further for, for ENAs, you have to use a technique which is called grazing incidence. It's also used on Pepe Colombo, where you have a, a a surface and the neutrals, when they graze along this incident at a very small angle, they, they um, give you a signal in the detector and you can measure them and you know exactly that they are neutrals because you removed all the ions before. Image is exactly, it's the flight spare of Inca. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's exactly the same, same instrument, yes. No? For, for what? For the, for the, for Inca? Yes, I mean, you, you ionize, you see it here. I mean, you ionize, you have an ionizing foil here, which is in this energy range. And you have a, a thicker foil in order to get higher energies later. And after, you know, it's a sort of a, a two-step um, measurement. So you ionize them, you fly with, the, with these remaining ions across this grazing incident um, surface, and what is left after that are only the neutrals. How do you ionize um, I th Well, actually, this is something I have to look into very much detail because this is, this is a very new technique, and no one has really seen that really before. Uh, but I must confess, I, I don't know the details. I have to look this up myself. It's just to show you that there are three different principles. And uh, so, but it will be flown, it will be flown on, on Pepe Colombo with uh, three different 
uh, energy ranges, and you see that they are, have, have different uh, principles. OK, um, the second part um, is the, the, the particles from the sun. And I'm, I know that you heard a lot about this already in other lectures, so I will be relatively short on that. Um, the energy range is somewhere between 10 keV per nucleon and the GeV range. The duration is a couple of days to uh, a couple of hours to days. And they are more frequent during solar maximum because some of the, uh, the particles are released in flares. Some of them are released in CMEs. And they are, of course, more, um, more frequent during solar maximum. So the, the ultimate energy source, which is released during the, the release of solar energetic particles, is the magnetic energy. And uh, in a very nice book, which I can really recommend by Cullen Rode, <coughs> and a, a, an overview principle, uh, an overview article by her, uh, shows very nicely how in detail this works. So you see that there is some instability, which is um, releasing magnetic energy from the sun uh, in flares or in coronal mass ejections. You can distinguish between fast and slow uh, coronal mass ejections here. Um, and some of them have a CME-driven shock, which then release in different, uh, in, a, in a whole variety, uh, releasing escaping particles, the SEPs, from those uh, CMEs. Um, in, in, the, in the case of flares, you have heating going on in the loops of the, the magnetic fields uh, from the surface of the sun, uh, uh, which is a radiation is released from there, and so you see particles in, in higher energies coming out of flares. So if you classify those particle events, you can look at uh, various parameters. For example, the helium-3 to helium-4 uh, ratio uh, in helium-rich or impulsive or gradual events. And all this, you can go through that and can find a very nice classification of uh, solar energetic particle events. Um, you see that. Some of them are um, not uh, with, with CMEs, but sometimes uh, you see um, a lot of, of particles in CMEs which have no helium-3 rich um, component. So it's, it's a lot of varieties which you try to classify. And if you want to measure them with particle instrumentations, you need to know where you have to put your instrument in, in the heliosphere. Um, and of course, you know that some of those structures can also hit the Earth, creating very nice polar lights, for example. Um, and um, so the, the structure of a CME is uh, you know, very, very nicely summarized in a, a thesis from one of our students, um, uh, Luciano Rodriguez, um, that they have um, these loop-like structures forming nearly uh, all the time a shock. Then you have a sort of a cavity where there are not very many particles. And then in the center of this uh, co-rotating interaction regions, you have a core uh, um, of, uh, of energetic particles um, behind this cavity. And if we go, of course, if some of those loops are uh, disconnected from the, uh, from the sun, from the surface itself, then they fly through the entire heliosphere, creating all these disturbances uh, at, the, at the planets. But there are also other loops where the disconnection uh, at, the, at the sun does not occur. So you have a very long elongated loop, which is then also uh, showing that you have still bidirectional electrons, for example, along the field lines, um, showing you that you are still connected back to the sun. Um, some of the parameters you can find here, um, the ejected mass is very high, from 5 to 50 billion tons of material is, is ejected in some of those CMEs. And uh, the energy is also quite high, 10 to the 23rd joule. So um, the angular width is, of course, also something which is um, changing over time when it's released from the sun. And uh, this is just one of these examples of a, a large CME-related SEP event. So you see, again, this loop-like structure, the cavity and the core here. Uh, this is, um, you know, it's a Lasco image from, um, from the SOHO spacecraft, where you block the sunlight itself in order to 
be able to see the coronal mass ejections um, um, coming out of the sun. <clears throat> and this is what has been measured then in one of the NOAA satellites a couple of uh, minutes later. So you see this is normal background of uh, uh, interplanetary space. And then you see this arrival of the CME with an increase of uh, three, four orders of magnitude in different energy ranges. And then when you when the, the shock itself passed by from the CME-related shock, then you see even a further increase in particles. And then you have a gradual decay, exponential decay, after um, this uh, CME passes over you. So you see it's a very important um, plasma uh, uh, accelerator, um, accelerating source of particles in the heliosphere uh, when such a shock passes by. And you heard all the details in the lecture by Burgess and by Chakalona. Um, another um, very nice figure by Cullen Roth in 2003 is uh, the, the understanding of how the particle acceleration looks like in these flare events, um, where you have uh, an impulsive and a gradual uh, flare, different uh, behavior here shown in this figure. Essentially, what happens is that you have a loop here with a lot of electric, uh, electromagnetic radiation at the foot points in the chromosphere, between the chromosphere and the photosphere. Um, they are somehow pinched off here in reconnection, where the magnetic fields are simply pinched off and uh, is released. Uh, and some of the shock waves and the ejected filament of particles is released. And during this reconnection process, the energetic particles are accelerated at the reconnection site and are um, flying out in, into the heliosphere. Um, on the left-hand side, you see this, um, that you have uh, what they call a flaring loop here, where there are electromagnetic waves created in, down in the corona. And these open field lines are simply stretched out, um, accelerating particles very close to the surface of the, um, of, of the sun itself. So um, originally, I planned to. Uh, continue here with particles at shocks, but having seen the lectures given to you, I will skip this and will concentrate a little more on, uh, on, on the other parts which you haven't seen before. So I will continue. Um, I don't know how much time is left, but I think I can continue with a few slides here, and then we make the break and the particles in the, helios in the, in the magnetosphere in the, second, in the second part. So um, particles from interstellar space. I mean, also here, you saw already a lot of uh, galactic cosmic ray um, features um, by in the Chakalonia lecture. I want to add something which is important also later for the uh, understanding of the radiation belts of the planetary magnetospheres, which is the so-called Grand process. I don't know if you have ever heard about the Grand process. Obviously not. OK. So Grand stands for cosmic ray albedo neutron decay. And it's simply a process where a cosmic ray comes in and uh, produces neutrons um, via the, the knockoff of nucleons in the target material. So you can think of, uh, in this case, this is a simulation result. Um, in this case, a 30 G, a GeV uh, pro, uh, proton, cosmic ray proton, comes in from interstellar space, hits, for example, the atmosphere of the Earth, creating Nuclear, um, creating neutrons in the atmosphere of the Earth. And then there are a couple of them are uh, lost. The, ma the majority of them are lost uh, in, in, in space. But uh, also a few of them, they decay in the beta minus process and become lower energy protons. And this is actually one of the sources that you can uh, identify that uh, the protons in the inner radiation belts of, especially from uh, Saturn and Jupiter, is more or less the only source you can find in order to get those inner radiation belts uh, populated with uh, energetic particles. And here you can see that um, in the simulation results that uh, there's not only protons produced and neutrons, there's all kinds, a whole zoo of particles uh, being uh, created when such a cosmic ray hits a, a target, such as the atmosphere or the rings of Saturn, or any material, they are creating secondary particles. Um, and then they are decaying some of them in this uh, grand process. 
And this is very important. You will hear about this later. Another add-on in terms of interstellar um, material. Um, this is an add-on of what you have seen in one of the other lectures by, by Ciacalone already. But this is a new result. It's a, in a science paper by Tom Grimichis, which recently appeared just two weeks ago, where um, you can see Voyager results of the galactic cosmic ray by, uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a proton channel of about greater than 200 MeV. Um, and you can see here that this is the normal um, cosmic ray background, so to speak, uh, inside the heliosphere. And this is about the, um, the energetic particles measured very close to the boundary of the heliosphere. And what they claim in their paper, but they're still not absolutely sure, it's going back and forth, that we crossed really the boundary because they have seen that the lower energies, they drop completely down to background, while the cosmic ray are lifted up, cosmic ray background are lifted up and stays more or less, more or less constant since. So, well, this, these are the, the motion of the boundary. That's, you know, it's, it's like a magnetopause. It's, uh, it's the boundary of the heliosphere, which is moving by a couple of AU. <laughs> and so you see you once in a while in and out, and you cross them several times. It's wavy. It's not a, you know, a stable structure. It's simply something which is going back and forth. And, and therefore, you know, at this time, they were saying, yes, we are about to leave our heliosphere. And then a couple of weeks later, they went back to normal background and so on. It happened several times. So no one knows, actually, if this is it's really, or if you are out and you have a, a very long, elongated, and compressed uh, heliosphere at the moment, and you will get in back again. Actually, Tom Grimichis, he showed me an extra plot where there is a slight decrease here already and an increase here. So it, you might be back <laughs> again. So it's a, it's a big discussion going on at the moment. But you see, also very far in the, in the heliosphere, you still can measure uh, energetic particles in the uh, KEV and MEV range. And above, um, this are uh, interstellar, is interstellar material coming from the interstellar space into our heliosphere. So it's a very important aspect of energetic particle measurements. The other extreme is, of course, the low energy cold neutral gas, which is coming in from interstellar space, which are then reacting inside our heliosphere, creating also energetic particles uh, due charge exchange or pickup processes and all these uh, the different um, processes you heard about already. So this is one of the first complete maps of uh, neutral gas measurements in our heliosphere. What you see here is simply um, uh, Mercator projection of the heliosphere where the sun is here. This is um, the position of Jupiter during that time period. And you see here, this is the galactic plane or the Milky Way, essentially where there are uh, some of the UV stars um, emitting some light. And then in addition, you see this big blob of uh, incoming particles, um, which uh, we think, or uh, Manfred Witte thought at that time uh, is due to interstellar neutral gas. So this interstellar neutral gas is coming in. Uh, it's neutral. It doesn't see the, uh, the um, magnetic field of, uh, of the sun. So it's simply on straight trajectories coming in into the heliosphere. And if you have a, a detector moving around, scanning the entire sky for months or years, then you can take such a, a, an image there. And of course, by looking at the, the distribution along that little blob, you can find out all the parameters you're interested in, the velocity, the temperature, and also the, um, the density of the interstellar medium. Recently, there has been two other approaches, and you may have heard this before. If you look at IBEX results and also Cassini results, um, you can measure these energetic neutral atoms I was talking to you before. And this is, so to speak, the higher energy component of the incoming neutral gas. Um, because this neutral gas, when it's coming in into the heliosphere, is charge exchanging with the charged particle population near the, near the boundary. And I showed you that this boundary is relatively sharp if you have reached it. So an incoming um, or an, an outflowing um, charged particle is hitting the incoming uh, neutral gas. 
is charge exchanging with, with each other. You have a high energy neutral atom, which you can measure with these two detectors, and the low energy ions you will measure with another detector. So there has been two different approaches um, by IBEX, which is a mission flying in Earth orbit, and also with Cassini. And Cassini is, as you know, is uh, in orbit around Saturn. And, uh, but because of the trajectory, um, at some times, the, um, the ENA detector on board Cassini is able to look not towards inside the Saturn system, but also looking outside towards the heliospheric boundary. And whenever this was possible, the Inca uh, camera was also looking uh, to find a signal from ENA uh, from the heliospheric boundary. And these are the two maps, which slightly look different, but it's a different energy range, and it's also a different accumulation. Um, but essentially, they, they both show this is the, uh, the sort of the um, Milky Way. And uh, there's, there's one blob here in the center where the nose of the, magnetos of the heliosphere looks like. And, and very close to that nose, this is where the inflow of particles is, uh, is coming. OK, I think we should stop here. And then after the break, I will show you what energetic particles can be used for in the planetary magnetospheres. Thank you.